I have ADHD. Raise your hand if you know you have ADHD. Okay, raise your hand if you think you might have ADHD. Mm, not too many people attacked by the memes on social media, I see. And raise your hand if you know someone with ADHD. Keep your hand raised and notice that there are a lot of people in the room raising their hands right now. This is a career that attracts a lot of people with ADHD. Some of you probably know what it is, but we always define our acronyms. So ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. This is the name for this disorder in the DSM-5, which is the diagnostic manual for mental health professionals in the United States. There are plenty of problems with the DSM-5. One of them is the name for this disorder. Attention deficit is a horrible name for this. I have plenty of attention. It's focusing it on what I should be focusing on that I struggle with. So I and many others have said attention regulation would be a much better name. I think it would really cut down on the kinds of questions like why do they have enough attention for video games but not chores? The DSM-5 defines three subtypes for this disorder. Inattentive, hyperactive slash impulsive, and combined type. I have combined type, which means I get symptoms from the other two types. And the fact that there are people who have those other two types means that some people are hyperactive and some people aren't. Disorder is an important part of the name because the DSM-5 basically describes disorder as it's causing you or the people around you so much distress that you need help. So yes, everyone loses their keys every once in a while, but if you lose your keys like every single day or multiple times a day, that's a problem that you need help for. When I got diagnosed a few years ago, I already had a psychology degree. So I started processing my diagnosis through the lens of that degree. As part of earning that degree, I participated in research on how stigma prevents people from seeking mental health help. So I live my life in a way that shines light on the shame. So I talk about it, and I started writing about it. A few years ago, I wrote a six-part series on how coding and ADHD uh, came together for me. And I started much the way that I started this talk by talking about how ADHD brains work a little bit differently. At its core, it's an executive function disorder. An executive function is the big front part of your brain that controls things like willpower, how many things you can think about at once, planning, starting tasks, organization, a lot of things that are necessary to live an organized, planned life. This creates an interest-based motivation system. So it's not importance-based. It doesn't matter if my house is going to burn down if I don't do the task. I'm going to struggle to do the task if it's not novel, the right amount of challenging, stimulating, fascinating, or interesting in some way. The best way I have to describe this is, will they press the button? If there's no reward associated with the button, or God forbid, a negative consequence associated with the button, I'm going to struggle to press it. If there's an okay reward, I'm going to struggle to press it. If I don't know the reward, I'm going to struggle to press it. But if there's a great reward, I'm going to press that button as many times as physically possible. Um, and then the next four parts of the series, I divided into the way that I see problems forming when I try to do any task, but especially coding. Can't start, can't keep going, can't stop, and can't remember. I mapped uh, ADHD symptoms to these four parts and talked about tips and tricks. The biggest trick of all is that all of the tricks will stop working eventually and you have to rotate through them. Then I was inundated in comments, comments from people saying they felt less alone, they had shared this series with their coworkers and finally gotten accommodations that they needed, that they thought they always just struggled with things and they were finally going to seek help for these problems. It has been years since I wrote this blog series, and I'm, I got a comment about this last week. And if I've forgotten to respond to your comment, I'm so sorry, I love all of them. And I realized that I was doing what everybody else does to people with ADHD, and that's tell them that there's a productivity bar, and they're not meeting it. It's estimated that children with ADHD receive 20,000 more negative messages by the age of 10. So I started a sixth part to the series called Where We Excel. And if you walked in here knowing one thing about ADHD, it's that we're distractible. So you may be surprised to see that this is the first thing in the list. It's part of can't stop, can't keep going, and can't remember. But while you may be able to filter out 
all of the information around you, how the light is flickering through the room, the air on your skin, the little noises that people make just by existing around you, we don't. That's part of distractibility. But it also means that we're absorbing information that other people aren't. We're taking in so many things that we make connections and recognize patterns that other people don't. And that makes us great at systems thinking. When the toaster breaks, we don't just think about the toaster, we also think about the power cord and the outlet and whether or not the power is working. And we often love full stack. I know people with ADHD who can't even start a ticket without knowing the context of how it fits into the system. And we're creative. Some of that may be hyperactivity for some of us. If you can think more thoughts per second, you're probably going to have more ideas. But we're constantly brainstorming. We reject the status quo. I've never met a person with ADHD who accepted we've always done it this way as a great reason to keep doing it that way. I once had a senior tell me, Abby, we survived without documentation. And I immediately responded, that's not a rule. That doesn't mean I have to. And he was like, you're correct. We're the definition of thinking outside the box. I have a meme here that shows a bunch of planes and they're labeled with fr uh, frameworks for getting people to generate ideas, like brainstorming sessions. And one of the superheroes looks back at the other one and says, look at what they need to mimic a fraction of our power. Hyperfocus is a double-edged sword. Hyperfocus is the struggle to pull your attention away from something that you're interested in focusing on. And it's part of our curiosity. We don't stop to ask if it's hard. We don't stop to ask if we should be learning it. We're willing to work long hours if we're interested in the thing that we're working on because we may start hyper-focusing on it. And we're always willing to try just one more thing. One of the reasons I got diagnosed is because my husband would come home and I would have been coding for eight hours straight. No breaks, no water, no food. And he'd say, hey, when's the last time you took a break? And I would say, mm, far too long, but I'm just gonna try one more thing before I stop. And all of that came together as in interviews, I kept being called the passionate programmer. And the reality is, much like Danny Donovan's comic here of Graveyard of Abandoned Hobbies, I'm passionate about whatever seizes my interest. I'm sure there are plenty of people in here who have taken apart something without knowing how to put it back together, just because they wanted to know how it worked, and they were interested, and then maybe not wanted to put it back together again because the novelty was gone. This can also be rabbit holes. We want to know how it works. Danny Donovan describes it as the ADHD urge to whip out your phone and Google unanswered questions because unanswered questions make your brain itchy. And this makes us great at troubleshooting a bug. Everything from the rabbit holes to the systems thinking and the creativity and everything in there means that we will often remember something from a rabbit hole that we went down about some weird quirk about JavaScript right when it's necessary because we have a weird bug that nobody else can figure out. And this one's for my managers. We're very easy to reset and reward. Some of that is the distractibility, and we can't remember. So if we get upset about something and then forget about it, just don't remind us. But sprints and tickets are really great ways to get us to do work because they're already planned, they're already organized, they're already prioritized, they're often time blocked. A lot of teams have rules about how long you should be stuck. And then once you're done with that ticket or that sprint, you get something novel, which is rewarding in and of itself. We love coding puzzles, so we'll often be rewarded by the work that we get to do. And we love praise, because remember, we get a lot of negative messages. So yes, if your brain works differently, you're going to run into problems with not fitting into the right-shaped hole, so to speak. But that doesn't mean that the way you think can't be a boon. So, celebrate being a firework in a world that wants you to be a cube. Thanks.